All right, well, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Edie. I work for the Land Trust. It's nice to be able to offer these online events right now so that more of you can join us. Um, our presenter this evening is Jason Dombrowski. Jason is the manager of the Cornell University Insect Collection and coordinator of the Insect Diagnostic Lab. He has 28 years of experience mothing and many years of experience giving talks on natural history. This is Jason's sixth year doing moth night for the Land Trust. So we hope you enjoy learning about the moths of the Finger Lakes. If you're not already a Land Trust member, please consider joining us so that we can continue our conservation work in the region. Um, there will be some time at the end for questions. So if any pop up during our talk, please type them in the chat window and we'll try to address them at the end. All right, it's all you, Jason. All right, well, thanks everyone for showing up to this virtual moth night. Uh, and happy Moth Week, everyone. Uh, it's National Moth Week, for those of you that aren't aware. Um, and basically, it's a week where a bunch of us mothers are trying to promote how interesting moths are to the general public. Uh, COVID has sort of put a damper on public events, except for virtual ones like this. So uh, hopefully, we're in for a treat uh, with fewer mosquitoes bothering you than it would be uh, during a regular moth night. Um, Basically, for those that are new to Zoom, I just want to mention a few things here. Um, make sure you're muted so that we don't hear you breathing while I'm talking. Um, and if you can turn off your video for now, um, it helps with the bandwidth so that the presentation flows a bit smoother. Um, and then the other thing I'll mention on your sidebar, you should on the right have a bunch of faces talking at you. Uh, I'm one of them. Um, you can actually drag that. If you don't want to see my ugly mug, you can drag that off screen so you don't have to watch me. Or you can watch me gesticulate about how cool, how cool moths are. All right, but without any further ado, let's get into uh, the naturalist of the moths of the Finger Lakes. Oh, let's see if this will work here. Click. Ah, good. So. We're going to cover several things over the next hour. Uh, first, we'll talk about what exactly is a moth. We're gonna talk about the four Fs of insect behavior, um, feeding, fleeing, fighting, and uh, reproduction. Um, and then we'll follow that up with why are moths important? Why am I here to tell you about why they're so cool and why, why they're so important? And then lastly, I'll do a little bit on how to find moths yourself. So, um, first, let's start with what are moths? Uh, well, moths are insects, and insects typically have three main body parts. Uh, I'll turn on my little pointer here, laser pointer, there we go. Uh, they got a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Um, and moths belong to a group of insects called the Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera literally translates to scaly winged. And in fact, if you look up close to a moth's wing, you'll see it is covered in these overlapping shingle-like scales. Uh, and these scales actually cover the entire body. Uh, so not just the wings, but the thorax, the head. And if you were to take all the scales off of a moth, we'd be, what you'd be left with are transparent wings and a shiny brown body with shiny legs and whatnot. One thing you've probably heard multiple times on Old Wives' Tale is that if you take the scales off of a moth or the, the powder off a moth, it can't fly anymore. Well, it's not true. It still can fly, it just will not be very pretty because that's where all the color is. Let's go through the three main body parts uh, of a moth. First, we start with the head. Uh, the head is basically where a lot of the sensory organs are. They've got a pair of antennae, which they use to taste and smell the world around them big compound eyes made up of many tiny lenses, a proboscis quite often, which is basically a drinking straw for drinking fluids. Um, and then if we move on to the thorax, the middle section of the insect, here you can see it right here on this plume moth, it's basically a big box of muscles. That's where the wings are attached and the legs are attached. And lastly, we've got the abdomen. And this is actually a wingless moth. This is a female of a linden looper, which the female, adult female do not have wings. And here's the abdomen. And the abdomen typically takes up the bulk of the insect and it contains both the guts 
and the genitalia. And one thing you'll discover, if you talk to anybody that's interested in moths and is really hardcore into it, we will talk your ear off about moth genitalia and how cool it is. Part of it is because it's crazy cool and complicated. Here's one of the guys I work on actually, um, where there's just all these complicated spiny bits and grabby bits and whatnot. And in many cases, we don't actually know what they do. It's just that they work. Now, why do we care so much about moth genitalia? It's because for a lot of species that are tough to identify, it's the most reliable way to identify them. Uh, and at the end of the talk, I'm gonna have a screen up uh, linking to some uh, various uh, resources where you can actually learn how to do your own moth dissections. I strongly recommend it, it's really cool. So all the characters I've talked about so far apply just to the adult, uh, but there are four different parts of the life cycle of a moth. It's, and we'll go through this with the forest tent caterpillar, which is uh, flying right now. Uh, first, it starts out in the egg stage, and here you can see the eggs in this species are wrapped around a twig and they spend the winter like this. Those eggs hatch into a caterpillar. Now the caterpillar is basically the feeding stage of the insect. And it does almost all the feeding and this in, in this species in particular it does all the feeding um, and caterpillars are voracious in fact the world record holder for the animal that eats the most is a moth that we actually have here in the finger lakes the polyphemus moth um, and i'm just going to read the numbers here because i'm terrible with numbers it eats eighty six thousand times its birth weight in a matter of about two months um, now my brain's not good at wrapping itself around big numbers. So to put this in perspective, if you had a standard 137 ounce baby, it would have to eat 334 tons of baby food in two months. And again, that's another big number. So if you actually take it down to how many jars of baby food a baby would have to eat, it's about one every two seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for two months. That's a lot of food. So they're moving a lot of biomass and we'll talk about that uh, later on in the talk. Now, once the larva is eaten and grown, eaten and grown, and that's where basically most of the nourishment comes from and most of the growth happens is in the larval stage, the caterpillar, then it goes into the pupal stage. And in a lot of moths, the pupa's inside what's called a cocoon. So basically some silken structure to protect it. Um, and inside there, old body parts are being broken down, new body parts are being developed, and eventually an adult moth emerges. Um, and an adult moth does not grow. It's there to mate and lay eggs, and that's it. Uh, so if you see a small moth, it will never ever grow into a bigger moth. Um, and that's often the shortest part of the insect's life cycle. So now, We've talked about the life cycle, we've talked about the characters of Lepidoptera, but this applies not just to moths, but to butterflies as well. They're both in the Lepidoptera. So what's the difference? Well, the short answer is there's not really an important difference. The butterflies are basically a specialized lineage of moths. In our area, roughly, there's roughly 20 species of moths for each species of butterfly, so the moths are much more diverse. But locally, our butterflies have typically some sort of club at the, end, at the end of the antenna. And their wings are often held up high over the back. Whereas um, moths either have straight antenna with no club, feathery antenna like the Cecropia moth, or a really elongate club. And they often rest with their wings over their back, out flat, or sometimes up. So it's all over the map. But basically there's no difference. Now, why do I say there's no difference? Because if we look at a phylogeny, so who's related to who with moths, this is what the Lepidoptera looks like. You've got all these groups up here, which are micromoths, the Microlepidoptera. And on average, micromoths are small. And over here, we've got the macromoths. And on average, macromoths are big. About half our species are here and about half our species are here. And butterflies sit right in the middle of the micromoths. They're most closely related to the micromoths. Now, if you talk to someone that's not too keen to mothing, they might be a little afraid of moths. and be like, oh no, my sweater, oh, moths are terrible things. You know what? Closed moths are just one tiny snippet of the diversity of moths out there. It actually took me several years to find my first closed moth. I would put sweaters out hoping to find a closed moth and I just would never find one. It took me moving to a dirty frat house um, to finally get my first closed moth. So they're just not ubiquitous in nature. We do have them in the Finger Lakes and they do occur outside. Uh, but they typically are in weird habitats. Like we actually have one of our clothes moths that's native here that feeds primarily in owl pellets. So regurgitated owl animal bits. You know, you get other ones on things like dried dung. Um, but 
most moths in our area feed on plants. So pretty much almost all of our, our moths are plant feeders. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are external feeders like this Canadian owlet you can find on tall meadow root right now. Um, but some are actually hidden internal feeders. So here is a goldenrod that's cut open and you'll notice that goldenrods often have swellings in the stem. If you get nice round ones, that's typically done by a fly. But if they're a little more slender, you get, there's two different types of moths that will do that. And here's one of them. This is the goldenrod gall uh, moth, uh, Noromoshima gallus solidiginus, which uh, you'll find this time of year, it makes a swelling in the plant. And if you cut it open, you'll find the caterpillar inside there. They're um, a very common strategy amongst smaller moths, especially the micromoths, is to make some sort of leaf shelter about, uh, of, uh, of what they're eating. So here's a red trillium with a black patched clepsis caterpillar on it. And typically it rolls one of the petioles into a little tube and lives inside there. And then if you poke the ears of the petiole, like I did for this photo, it comes out to say hello um, and does its feeding that way. So they're, they're concealed feeders in many cases. Speaking of cases, some will make their own case. This is a birch case bearer. And what you've got here is two pieces of birch leaf that have been cut out and stitched together. And the caterpillar lives inside that case. And what it's done here is it's cut a little hole into the birch leaf and has stuck its body in there and is eating the center of the leaf. So between the upper and lower layer of the leaf, completely protected from a lot of predators. And then there's a whole interesting group called the leaf miners. And basically what these are doing is just like that case bearer, but they're spending their entire caterpillar life in between the upper and lower layer of a leaf. So they're basically eating the meat out of the sandwich. And what, so what's going on here, this is where the egg was laid by the female, the caterpillar hatched, burrowed into the leaf and has eaten the inside of the leaf, has pooped in various spots. And there's the caterpillar right there taking a rest. Now, most of our caterpillars are terrestrial, you'll find on land, but we do have some interesting aquatic ones that can be very common. If you see uh, a yellow or white water lily where the part of the leaf has been cut out and folded underneath the water, if you open that up, you'll find one of these lovely caterpillars. This is a pondweed moth called parapoinx, um, and parapoinx has these lovely gills on the side of the body. And when they live in this, inside this leaf shelter, they actually will undulate their body like this to cause water to flow past them to get as much oxygen as possible. Now, most of our caterpillars, as I mentioned, feed on plants, but there are some weirdos. I talked about the ones in owl pellets, but there's also some that feed only on fungi. This is one called the masked uh, cutworm, and it feeds just on fleshy fungi. So they have very fast life, life cycles because those fungi don't last very long. So that's the caterpillars. Now the adults do some feeding. In some cases, the adults actually don't have functioning mouth parts. So they're basically batteries. They're living off stored fat uh, from the larva. Here though is one that does visit flowers. This is a spotted thyrus, uh, which is fairly common in the Finger Lakes, but it's only diurnal. You only get it during the day. And it visits various flowers where they drink nectar and you know are probably a moderate pollinator. More on that later. But more often where you'll see moths feeding, remember they've got a coiled tubes, so they can only drink fluids, is at dung. Dung and especially urine puddles are fantastic places to find both moths and butterflies. Uh, in fact, a, a good friend of mine uh, was doing a radio interview once uh, on a national radio show and uh, Colin uh, asked, how do I attract butterflies and moths to my yard? And he said, well, poop and pee in your yard. It's great. Your neighbors won't like it, but it attracts a lot of stuff. Uh, so why are they visiting this? That's disgusting. Well, these large aspen tortrix are both male. And what they're doing is they're drinking this um, wolf feces to get salts. And these salts they need for sperm production. Because in some species, the females can actually tell how salty a male is and decide who to mate with basically on how much salt they've got. Because those nutrients are then passed on to the offspring to help uh, nourish the eggs. Now, in some cases, it's absolutely spectacular. This is uh, admittedly an unspectacular looking moth. It's called the common glufizia, and it's about, uh, about the size of my thumbnail. So not a very big moth. But would you believe me if I told you that this moth can pee farther than I can? Well, it can. Now, here's why and why it has to. So first of all, the caterpillars of this thing feed on aspen, which is has a lot of phenolic compounds and it's difficult to eat and is also very low sodium. Well, the males need sodium, so they visit mud puddles. Now, if you're a moth that's this big and you're visiting a mud puddle, 
you have to drink, first of all, a lot of water. So they drink huge amounts of water. They absorb most of the sodium, an incredible amount of it, but then they have to pee. Now, if you're this big, you're going to pee right back into your puddle. Well, you don't want to do that. So with some research done at Cornell here a number of years back, we actually discovered this. Tom Eisner and his student uh, discovered that, I'm going to actually quote the paper because I think it's a great quote. Males of the nododontid moth Glyphysia septentrionis routinely puddle for hours, imbibing hundreds of gut loads and voiding the fluid as repetitive anal jets. And these anal jets can actually shoot about a meter in distance. It's incredible. Um, it's something I wanted to actually try to see someday. So we talked about how they get food. Now there's a gazillion different ways uh, that moths can die. There's so many things out there trying to kill them. I think I drew on my screen somehow. <laughs> I don't know how to turn that off. Uh, erase. Uh, oops. All right. Well, that's going to be on there for now. Um, oh, what am I doing? I am having a klutzy moment here. Oh, no. Oops. Sorry. Uh, don't try to do stuff. Okay, share screen. Are we back? Give me a thumbs up. Yep, all right, good. Whew, sorry about that. Um, all right, so a gazillion different things are, are, are trying to kill moths. So one of the most important things that can kill off a population pretty much, uh, sometimes like 95, 90% of population is bad weather. It's things like a sudden cold snap at the wrong time of year, a heavy rain can kill off large numbers of young caterpillars, even heavy winds can do that. So weather can be the enemy. And things like diseases. So here is something called nucleopolyhydrosis virus, NPV. And when you get high densities of caterpillars, this virus will sometimes sweep through a population and kill almost all of them. And what's neat, when they freshly have been killed from the virus, they're basically this hanging sack of goo. It's like picture a paper bag filled with water, that texture. And about 50% of their body mass is virus bodies that are just being shed into the wind to infect other caterpillars. And it's not just viruses. There's all kinds of fungal pathogens that will do it as well. So here's the caterpillar of a great tiger moth on the left um, and a donacula moth on the right. Both have been infected by fungus and have fungal spores bursting out of the body, um, basically trying to infect other caterpillars or other caterpillars and moths. Um, and in wet years, this can be a huge cause of mortality. Then you've got all kinds of different insects that are trying to kill them, things we call parasitoids. And parasitoids are like a parasite, except they kill the host in the end. This is a princess wasp, also called nicnemonid. And princess wasps, this particular one, feeds on spiny caterpillars. So the female will smell around trying to find one. Once she finds one, she jabs it with this crazy ovipositor over here. And that ovipositor then will jab an egg inside the body, and in some species, a virus as well. And that virus will knock down the immune system of the caterpillar so that that wasp grub can feed on the internal organs. Now they keep the caterpillar as live as long as possible. They don't want to kill it right away. They want fresh meat at all times. So that the larvae, the wasp larvae inside the body are careful not to hit any vital organs. So basically they're eating fat bodies and whatnot. And then the end result, the caterpillar dies. Now here's a different species uh, where we've got a forage looper. And what you can see is right at the end of the body, there's the cocoon from the wasp that has crawled out of the body once it's finished the development. The caterpillar is not feeding anymore, but the rest of its life, it is gonna defend that cocoon to its death. Anything that comes to attack that cocoon, it will bite, it will thrash at. Um, it, the, the parasitoid has totally changed the behavior of that caterpillar. There's other interesting ones too. So um, in the top middle is what we call a braconid wasp. They're usually smaller than princess wasps. They're very common, very diverse. Um, and some of the species do what's called polyembryony. And that's where you get a female wasp that lands on a caterpillar and lays a single egg inside of it. That egg then hatches into a whole bunch of larvae that are clones of each other. And those larvae eat out the inside of the caterpillar just like the princess wasps. And on the one on the left here, what you can see is the end result where the larvae have finished feeding, they've burrowed out of the caterpillar and have spun cocoons. Um, and are ready to emerge into adults. On the right is a different caterpillar, similar sort of thing, but no cocoons. And basically these wasp larvae just turned it into Swiss cheese. 
And it's not just the caterpillars that are nailed by this, uh, even eggs. So here's a close up of some gypsy moth eggs. And these are tiny, these are the size of a pinhead. And this little wasp right here is called Enocertus, uh, Enocertus cuveni. And what it does is the female will lay an egg on that egg, which hatches into a little wasp grub that spends its entire life inside that single egg. And they'll often knock down gypsy moth populations in good numbers. And it's not just wasps. There's lots of different wasps that are parasitoids. There's a lot of flies that are important as well. This is what's called a tachinid fly. Looks kind of like a standard house fly, except it's got a lot of bristles on it. Um, we got a lot of species here locally. And what they do is the, the adult female will find a caterpillar and lay eggs on it. And these legs are usually laid on the outside. So here's one right here and here's another one. And you'll see these quite often on caterpillars. Usually it's 5% or less if you look at caterpillars. And those eggs will hatch into a little maggot that then bores inside the caterpillar. And just like those wasps will feed on the non-vital organ organs and kill it in the end. And here's a different type of tachinid fly. And I bring this one up because it's got a really cool way of getting inside a caterpillar. It doesn't find caterpillars. What it does is the female produces thousands of these tiny thick shelled eggs called microtype eggs. And it splatters them all over vegetation. It basically places eggs everywhere in the hope that a caterpillar accidentally eats it. And if a caterpillar accidentally eats this egg, it's really hard so it doesn't get damaged. It gets into the gut and then digestive enzymes trigger it to actually hatch into a maggot that then burrows into the caterpillar and does all kinds of nasty stuff. All right, so those are parasitoids. There's lots of those that are affecting uh, caterpillars and, and pupae and eggs even, um, but there's a lot of predators as well. Um, and so most um, insects are eaten by other insects and that's definitely the case for moths. So things like ants and wasps are huge predators of, of insects. So here we got a carpenter ant with a pug moth caterpillar right here. Um, and there's a lot of vertebrates as well. Things like mice, shrews, birds are all important predators of especially caterpillars. Um, and in fact, with a lot of these birds, like these, this is a red-eyed vireo, um, red-eyed vireos and a lot of these neotropical migrants travel all the way up here every summer for the abundant caterpillars that we have. Because otherwise, why not stay in the tropics? It's lovely down there. But we have so many caterpillars up here that all these things travel up here for them. Now, it's not just predators that are trying to kill these caterpillars. Plants are de defending themselves. And plants are not helpless. You know, a lot of people complain, oh, well, my poor plants, there's caterpillars on it. Well, mellow out. These plants can defend themselves. Um, this is this and the next slide are ones I snagged from a different talk I give. Uh, but you don't, I don't want you to read this. Just note that there's all these different chemicals that plants are producing to defend themselves from caterpillars. So things like caffeine. Caffeine, which is keeping me going right now, is an insecticide. That's why plants produce it, to kill insects. Um, things like saponins, which are soaps, basically destroy cell membranes. Um, cardiac glycosides, these, that's what milkweeds produce to kill off caterpillars. Some uh, chemicals will mimic hormones that cause the caterpillar to not grow properly. Um, we get things like proteinases. Like if you, if you ever have really fresh pineapple and you eat a lot of it, you'll notice that your mouth gets raw. That's because they've got a chemical called bromelain in there, which is a meat tenderizer. It breaks down proteins in your mouth. Um, and it does the same thing to caterpillars. Calcium oxalate, um, if you have jack in the pulpit, if you eat that, it's got calcium oxalate in it, which are really needle sharp um, crystals, which will shred your whole intestine and you'll have very bloody stools after that. So don't eat jack in the pulpit. Um, so there's all these chemicals that plants are producing to defend themselves from caterpillars. But the key thing to remember is poison is in the dose. All these plants around us have some sort of chemical to deter herbivory. Some have more than others. And some can actually increase the amount of defenses they've got. So if they're under attack by a caterpillar, they'll beef up whatever toxic chemicals they've got, which is expensive to produce, but will save you from a herbivore. And that herbivore might actually have to then leave. Um, and by beefing up these chemicals, some of them are actually volatile and travel into the air and other plants will pick up those chemicals. And so one tree will be under attack, it'll produce a chemical. Another tree over here will be, oh, that tree's under attack. I better beef up my chemicals in advance of whatever's attacking it. And some of these chemicals will actually attract parasitoids and predators to attack these caterpillars as well. All right, now, there are ways that, that moths can defend themselves. So one obvious one is camouflage. There's so many incredible examples of camouflage. We could just do a slideshow for hours of it, but I'll just show a few here. Um, and in many cases, it's very obvious what they're camouflaging as. 
like this hitched uh, arches. Um, here is a, a porcelain gray. Obviously, it's well camouflaged as a twig. But the key thing to remember, if you're depending on camouflage, you're only camouflaged if he sits still. So this then reduces the amount of time it can eat. So during the day, most of these camouflage caterpillars are sitting still. At night is when they do their feeding and you'll see them actually being active. Some have some pretty creative strategies. This is called a camouflage looper or a garbage caterpillar. And it's one of the inchworms. And what it does is it feeds on composite flowers. This one's on Rudbeckia. And what the caterpillar does is it cuts off parts of the flower and sticks it to its back. So this one you can see has cut off stamens from the flower and stuck it to, to its back. But sometimes you'll see really colorful petals on it. It's really quite stunning. Um, if you want to see this caterpillar yourself, it's very common this year right now, actually. If you go out to little patches of fleabane, what you'll see is sometimes a bunch of the flowers in the clump will be lacking petals. And if you look carefully, you'll sometimes see a caterpillar. It's very hard to see. And it will have those petals stuck to its back, covering it. Um, so it's pretty easy to find right now. Now, if the camouflage fails, the caterpillars do have another defense, and that's producing silk. And they'll basically put down a pad of silk and then do a drag line and drop down to get away from that predator. Now, this silk um, is produced by two chemicals called fibroin and sericin, and it's produced by this interesting machinery inside the salivary glands that is one of the most uh, bioactive um, machinery known in animals, where basically they produce proteins at such a rapid weight that you just don't see elsewhere. Now, the camouflage, of course, is not restricted to just caterpillars. The adults are often camouflaged. Um, this is Oligia centria, the uh, white streak prominent, um, which is very common, but often not noticed for some reason. To orientate you here, the head's down here. Here's the legs, and that's the butt end of the moth. Some look just like dead leaves, like this Kent's geometer. Um, and, and this is where I, I like to have a little side rant here, because a lot of people get interested in moths and do all kinds of moth photography. And they'll get a moth like this. All right, it lo obviously looks like a leaf. I've got to put it in a bunch of dead leaves to make it camouflage. You don't have to, because it doesn't have to sort of hide. It just has to look not edible to whatever wants to eat it. So a dead leaf looks like a dead leaf no matter where it is, as long as it's sitting still. And then there's a lot that actually will camouflage themselves as bird poop. And for whatever reason, birds tend to leave those things alone. This one's called Antiotrica. It's out right now. Um, and some will actually look like washed out bird poop, like this um, um, large lace border, which when I'm zoomed in looks obviously like a moth, but from a distance looks just like washed out bird poop. And for people that look at moths like me, we tend to look at a lot of bird poop thinking it's moths. Now, they don't just rely on camouflage. There's some that are obviously really brightly, boldly patterned. Um, this moth in the center is a painted lichen moth that's common right now at my lights. Uh, the caterpillars feed on lichens. They sequester various toxins from those lichens, like usnic acid, and hold it into the adults. So they're really not tasty looking. But they reinforce um, their toxicity by mimicking fireflies. So up here on the top right is a firefly. You can see that similarity in pattern. And fireflies are also quite toxic themselves. And there's others that are not toxic, but just try to look dangerous. So here's two different type of clear wing moths that, that typically fly during the day. They act like wasps. They look like wasps. They fooled me before. Actually, I did a program last year in Ohio where there was uh, a clearing moth flying around and someone's like, hey, is that one of the clearing moths? I was like, no, 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 that's, that's a princess wasp. That's an amaline princess wasp. Nope, no, it was a moth and I was fooled. Um, these guys are really impressive mimics. And some just have brilliant bold colors to advertise that they're just downright toxic. There's uh, a bunch of different beetles that will share this color pattern, all of which are very, very toxic. Now, um, other strategies that you'll see in some of the bigger moths are eye spots. Now, this is a polyphemus moth. This is the one that I mentioned earlier where the caterpillar eats a lot. They all do, but this holds the world record. Um, and basically, whenever a small predator like a bird, uh, by the way, this is, a, this is a pretty big moth. It's about this big. Uh, if a bird comes up to it, it will shutter its wings to make those eye spots look really bold. And if you're a predator that's smaller than this, that's terrifying looking to be startled uh, by large eyes like that. 
And it's not just the big moths that do it too. Um, this is a Petrophila moth, Petrophila follicalis, uh, which is one of the aquatic moths that we've got here very commonly. If you live near a stream, you'll get this. Um, and it's got little eye spots on the hind wing here. And you might think, well, what's that doing? This is very common in small moths. Well, what it's actually doing is mimicking the eyes of jumping spiders. So in some species, they actually have patterns on the wings that mimic a defense posture of a jumping spider. So they terrify jumping spiders, but also it's a distraction pose. So it looks like the head is up here. And so if a jumping spider did decide, ah, that's, that doesn't look too threatening, it could attack there and the moth will be able to get away. And big moths will do this as well. This is a Cecropia moth, our largest breeding moth. Um, and it's got an eye spot up near here, which makes it look like the head is up here. And quite often when you find one that's been around for a while, you'll see little uh, peck marks taken out from here because when a bird attacks it, it wants to go for the head. And well, this looks like the head, but clearly the head is down here. Others will do a startle response. This is an Ultronia underwing. They'll be flying in a few weeks. Um, and obviously well camouflaged on bark. But if a bird does discover it, what happens is they basically leap up. You see these bright red and black patterns that sort of strike out. And this will startle the bird for a second. It buys that moth a split second or two while the bird's like, whoa, what's going on here? And then when the moth's flying, that bird is now locked in. Okay, it's bright red and black. That's what I'm chasing. That's why I'm flying after it because in flight, that's what you see and it chases that bright red and black. And then all this moth has to do is fly around a tree, close up its wings, and that black and red moth is gone again. So it's a pretty effective strategy and it's used by a bunch of the moths in our area. And one sort of thing you see commonly, especially in smaller moths that always baffled me as a kid is iridescence. So they're beautiful. Like this is um, a clover case bearer and the iridescence will actually shimmy different, uh, uh, different colors in the sunlight. So it can be uh, copper or gold or greenish. Um, and I always wondered like, what kind of defense is this? This is not that useful, except that it makes them very hard to follow in flight in bright sunlight. So it's hard for predators to, to get a fix on it and catch them. And indeed, if you try catching them, even with a butterfly net, it is challenging to actually lock in on them because it plays tricks on your eyes. Now, there's some visual deception we talked about here, but there's a lot of interesting ways that caterpillars and moths will chemically defend themselves. So this is called a pus caterpillar. Uh, the head is right up here. And if you poke them in the head, like I did with this one, what they do is they swing around these spiky clubs at the very end of the body and whip out this gooey, stinky tentacle at you. And it's really quite rank smelling. I haven't tasted it yet, but it's probably really terrible tasting. But the, if something comes to attack them, they'll whap, whack them with that and basically make themselves very distasteful. Other ones get a little more nasty. Um, this is a lace cap caterpillar, uh, also called a white streak prominent. And first of all, the camouflage is impressive. So this is on a black oak leaf. And the black oak leaves in the fall, when this you'll find this caterpillar, have little orange tips to the points. And it sits there where there was a point. It's got these little blemishes on it, which they mimic over here. And you often get these brownish patches. So the camouflage is, first of all, amazing. Second, if, if a bird does discover it and pops this in its mouth, it'll be sorry. Because this whole segment of the body here, the second segment and this horn, is taken up by a gigantic gland that secretes formic acid. And so it's going to really burn if you pop that in your mouth. And it actually will actively squirt out of the tip of that horn. Now, the adults can also use nasty chemicals. Um, this is a virgin tiger moth. This is one that I poked, and I tend to like poking them in the head for some reason. This is one I poked in the head. And when you do that, there's a gland behind the neck here in the prothorax, um, which basically secretes toxic alkaloids in this gooey, bubbly mass. And it's awful smelling and probably worse tasting. And some are downright venomous. This is a spiny oak slug, uh, which is a type of caterpillar that you'll get on a variety of deciduous trees, but especially oaks. Um, and you'll see all these little spines on here, which aren't just physical deterrents, but this one actually injects venom uh, into the skin. And if you touch this, it feels like a bee sting, and some people are quite sensitive to it. But beyond that, you'll see a lot of hairy caterpillars. Uh, this is a hickory tussock moth, uh, which is one that made the news big time a few years ago, and it keeps making the news again 
and it's a classic example of how there is a kernel of truth to a whole bunch of BS that's being spread out there. So first of all, this caterpillar is hairy to defend itself. These hairs are barbed, and if you've got rough skin like the, the palm of your hand, it's probably not going to do much. But if you put that on sensitive skin like on your neck or in your mouth, those hairs break off and are really quite irritating and will irritate your gut lining if you try to eat that. Um, so don't eat these. Um, and some people are really sensitive to it and have are allergic reactions. And allergic reactions are nothing to joke about. But to the average person, this caterpillar is safe to handle if you're careful. Just don't put it in your mouth. Um, now, the news media ran with this a few years ago and basically said it was an invasive caterpillar from Canada. It kills people and all that. And be careful. They throw hairs. And it's just complete nonsense. Um, now, there are birds that can eat this. So basically, if you ever see a hairy caterpillar, those hairs are to, to defend themselves. Now, for a bird, though, I mentioned that it irritates gut linings. There are two strategies that can be used to eat a caterpillar like this. One is something that desperate crows and blue jays will do. And that is they take the caterpillar and whack it against the branch over and over and over and over again to knock off as many hairs as possible. Not an efficient strategy, but it works. The other thing is done by black-billed cuckoos. Um, and black-billed cuckoos are actually having a really good year up in the Finger Lakes because of gypsy mouth outbreaks, which are hairy caterpillars that are urticating hairs. Um, and basically what they do is they just eat the caterpillar whole and they specialize in hairy caterpillars. And then they'll shed their entire gut lining every few days and develop a new gut lining. So it's apparently a strategy that works really well. Now, there's some other interesting strategies to avoid parasitoids. So this is a warty birch caterpillar. Uh, the adults called the arched hook tip. Um, and one way that princess wasps will try to find caterpillars is they smell caterpillar poop. When they find a pile of caterpillar poop, they know they fly up and that's where the caterpillar will be. Well, this caterpillar circumvents that by what it does is it's got what's called an anal tubercle. Where when the poop is formed, it comes out and it gets held in this little thing and then gets catapulted away at high speeds. And they catapult poop off in all kinds of different directions to basically avoid uh, princess wasps finding them. Other ones have, have ways to avoid visual hunters. So for certain things like birds and some mammals, they will look for feeding signs. So if a leaf has a, a bite mark taken out of it, oh, there's probably a caterpillar nearby. Um, so things like this underwing caterpillar, what it will do is it'll either cut off an entire leaf when it's done feeding, um, or eat, one part, uh, eat on one part of the plant, and then when the sun rises, will crawl onto another part of the plant and spend the day there. Yet others, like some interims, do this interesting thing. This is a maple leaf that had an interim caterpillar on it that ate basically the, the lobes off of it to disguise its feeding sign. You can see it did that on this leaf as well to make it less obvious where it's been eating. And there's some that even taken a step further. Here's some more maple leaves where a caterpillar has nearly symmetrically eaten out the lobes of this maple leaf. You can see it's sort of done something similar here and here. Now this is a caterpillar that has fewer neurons in my pinky finger. Yet I couldn't do that with scissors. Like it's, it's amazing what these things can do. Now, if you are found by a parasitoid, all hope's not lost. Here's a tiger moth. Um, this is probably a virgin tiger moth, but the caterpillars of this group are hard to identify. Um, so if they get a, a, a tachinid fly parasitizing them, They'll feel, well, okay, something bad's going on here. I've got a parasite. Well, what they do is basically they will stop feeding on whatever plant they're feeding on, and they'll wander around and find the most poisonous plant that they can. And they will feed on that poisonous plant to try to poison out that parasite. And once they've killed that parasite, then they can switch back to a healthier plant. It's basically essentially the same as chemotherapy. So they're defending themselves chemically. Now, one of the major predators of adult moths are bats. Um, as you probably all know, bats use echolocation, so they bounce sound waves off their prey. And so they're not hunting visually at night, they're using sound. And a lot of moths are out at night, so they're bouncing sound waves off them. And bats then will scoop it up with their wing or the, the patagium, the, the skin flap between their legs, and scoop it up into their mouth all while flying. Well, some bats, or some moths actually have strategies to avoid bats. Some things like some of the cutworm moths, like this hologram looper, um, what they'll do is they've got ears on the side of the body. I'll show you what a moth ear looks like in a minute. And when they hear bats flying around 
and echolocating, they'll take evasive maneuvers and fly into dense vegetation. Other ones like sphinx moths will actually fold their wings up and plummet straight to the earth to avoid bats. But other ones like tiger moths, like this virgin tiger moth, what they do when they hear bats is they actually send back their own signal that jams the sonar of the bat. So the bat actually can't find the moth. And here's what they use both to hear and um, jam the sonar bats with. Here is the tympanum, the ear of a moth. So here's the head, here's the thorax, here's the abdomen, there's a wing that I've lifted up. And there is the ear of the moth. And those ears are what are picking up the sounds and also making the sounds as well. Now, I talked about moths with ears, and almost half of our moth species have ears of some sort for hearing bats. But even if you don't have ears, you sometimes have bat defenses. So this is called an ermine moth, and this moth has no ears whatsoever. However, its way of defending itself against bats is that as it flies, there's a little clicking mechanism in the wing, and that clicking mechanism is supersonic for us, but bats can hear it, and basically is a warning signal to the bat that do not eat this moth. It is really quite toxic. You will not enjoy it. All right, so we've talked about how, how moths can defend themselves. Let's talk about how they get together and have fun. Well, first of all, um, a lot of moths use pheromones. So they live in a very chemical world. Um, and a female, what she'll typically do is sit up on a perch, drop her abdomen down, and then produce a chemical pheromone. And that's typically made up of volatile chemicals like alcohols and aldehydes that will drift then in the wind and males will pick up that scent and fly to her. And that's the typical scenario for most moths. Um, and in that case, many of the, the male moths to pick up this chemical will have massively inflated antennae, so big side branches on the antennae. Uh, for example, in these luna moths, uh, the females on the left, the males on the right, you can see the male has much, much bigger antennae than the female um, because it has a big surface area to pick up that female. Um, in fact, in things like these giant silk moths like luna moths, they can pick up a female pheromone under ideal calm conditions from over a mile away. So it's, you know, think of that, like I sometimes complain when I'm in the elevator with someone with perfume, but these guys can pick up a pheromone from a mile away. It's just, it baffles the mind. Um, now in some of these moths, what happens, we, we, actually we don't know in most of them, but in some things like luna moths, the first male that gets there, the female goes, eh, you'll do, and they become friends. Um, with other moths though, they have to be a little more discerning. So here is a moth called Diarictria, one of the cone worms. And you know, it's a pretty unimpressive looking moth. And basically the female produces a pheromone, the male flies to her, and then he has to produce his own pheromone. And so this little inset picture here is from a great paper uh, by two colleagues of mine, um, where if you look at the very tip of the abdomen under a scanning electron microscope, here's what you'll see. These crazy complicated twisty things. These are all modified scales that each wick a different chemical, is this whole chemical cocktail. And each species has a different series of these crazy complicated scales. And this is so common in a lot of different moths where you've got these modified scales for producing pheromones in the males to try to impress the females. And some will have elaborate rituals and whatnot, but in most cases we just have no idea. And some of our moths, it actually gets pretty darn impressive. Uh, on the top left is the delicate cycnia, the caterpillars feed on dogbane. Uh, you can find the caterpillars pretty commonly right now on dogbane and Indian hemp. Um, and the males of this actually produce these coromata here. And these are basically inflated sacs with these little tendrils that produce chemicals. All right, so we've talked about um, how they get together. Let's talk about why moths are important. Well, first of all, they're important food for a lot of things. Um, so most are eaten by other insects. So here's a robber fly that's nailed a herpetogramma moth. Um, we talked about birds fly all the way from South America to get our abundant caterpillars, but they can have huge environmental change. Um, and part of this is because of the sheer biomass of them. So here's the, a photograph of the cover of a trail guide for a trail in Algonquin Park in Ontario. And I just love this picture because I think it illustrates the point really well. So what this is, is a representative drawing of the relative biomass, uh, above ground biomass of animals in a typical forest in Ontario. And it'd be comparable to what's here. So right now, you know, it, wolves, really insignificant part of the forest. Bears, eh, barely noticeable. Moose and deer, pff, not important. 
Rodents, okay, yeah, they're kind of important. Mice and chipmunks. Birds, yeah, okay, they're there. They're noticeable. Sandlanders, oh yeah, that's pretty important. But caterpillars make up most of that biomass. Insects are just so important, and much of that is caterpillars. Um, and they can have major effects. Now, this isn't from the Finger Lakes. This is from a few years ago when I was in New Mexico. And this is one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. So what I'm going to try to do for the next minute or so is try to convince you that insect outbreaks are the most beautiful things of nature. So what we have right here, this is an aspen forest in New Mexico. In July, all these aspen trees in most years would be bright green, covered in green leaves. Now, chances are none of these trees actually died because aspen are really resilient. But this is what it looked like mid-July. It was really quite amazing. So why is this a beautiful thing? Well, there's a lot of benefit to insect outbreaks like this. So first of all, nature abhors a monoculture. If you have a monoculture, nature will do whatever, whatever it can to get rid of it. And insect outbreaks are one of the great ways to do that. Now, this benefits a lot of plants and actually increases plant biodiversity. Here's why. When you take out a dominant plant, now all of a sudden you get all this sunlight coming down to plants that normally can't compete as well with a dominant plant. So for instance, here locally in some of the higher elevations, we get dominant sugar maple forests. Those sugar maple create ideal conditions for sugar maple and more sugar maple and more sugar maple. But when you get a big insect outbreak by let's say a saddle prominent or Bruce spanworm that wipes out the sugar maple canopy, those trees will come back it kills off the seedlings, but now things like eastern white pine, eastern hemlock, yellow birch, beech, all have a competitive advantage. And you actually increase diversity by allowing these rarer species to get a foothold. But it's not just that. These caterpillars, remember they eat a lot, which means they poop a lot. And caterpillar poop is called frass. And here's what the frass looks like for a, a hornworm caterpillar. And this frass is amazing fertilizer. So it's falling down from the canopy and fertilizing those remaining plants and giving them another advantage against the dominant plants. Um, and the other advantage is that this fertilizer is landing only during the growing season. So it's not being leached through the soil during the winter when tree roots are inactive. But beyond that, there's all these other animals that take advantage of it. Certain birds will actually have multiple broods per year. Things like black-billed cuckoos depend on outbreaks of hairy caterpillars. Certain warblers will have several broods a year if there's caterpillar outbreaks. Here's a beetle uh, called the frigid ground beetle that you normally don't see. However, if you get a massive outbreak of caterpillars, something triggers them to wake up. They typically lie dormant in the soil for a decade or more. When you get an outbreak, they just emerge from everywhere and they crawl up trees, they devour whatever caterpillars they can find, they lay eggs, those larvae devour caterpillars, develop into adults, and then they go back underground until the next outbreak. So these outbreaks are feeding frenzy for a lot of different things. So beyond insect outbreaks, hopefully I've convinced one or two of you that insect outbreaks are beautiful things. Um, but beyond that, caterpillars can be important for other reasons. This is called a glossy black idea. And it is a caterpillar that feeds only on dead leaves. There's a whole group of caterpillars here that, that are basically decomposers. Um, and many of you probably know this, but New York State has no native earthworms. Before Europeans got here, there were no earthworms. And the major macro decomposers at the time were probably these caterpillars. So they probably filled the role of earthworms. Now what's happening that earthworms are spreading? Well, we don't know. And then pollination, of course. Pollinators have been big in the news lately. Great, pollinators are in decline. As far as moths being pollinators, there are some definite um, examples of them being important pollinators. For instance, here's a primrose moth. Um, once primrose starts blooming, this moth is out. And the way to find it is they visit the flowers at night when they're open and the flower closes during the day. Usually they crawl inside the flower and the flower closes around them. So you'll see just the butt of the moth sticking out. This is one that missed the mark, so I was able to get a nice photo of it. But look carefully at primrose, you'll see the moth butts of this primrose moth. It's very, very common. Um, and in a few weeks from now, when the primrose have seed pods, you'll see the caterpillars, which are really well camouflaged on the seed pods, feeding on those as well. So in this case, it's a clear example of where it's a pollinator. In many cases, there probably are other pollinators, both during the day of night uh, and night of moths and various flowers. But overall, I'd say moths are probably not that significant overall as, as far as pollinators go. So we've talked about moths. I hopefully got you interested in moths. How do you find moths? Well, I, today I took a few pictures of my setup. So this is my setup this morning. Um, what you've got here is a white sheet and a light. 
that's all you need. In fact, just turn on your porch light. You'll have moths that come to it. Um, I'm a step up from a porch light here. What I've got is what's called a mercury vapor bulb. Um, you can get a reasonably good one from any pet store. It's a, they're reptile heat lamps. Just make sure they produce UV because UV is very attractive to a lot of moths. Um, you can also use ultraviolet lights. So you can get UV bulbs for fairly cheap. Um, the thing with, UV, uh, with uh, mercury vapor lights, though, is be very careful to get very hot, so don't touch them, hotter than a regular light bulb, and also keep them out of the rain. So you'll see there's a little canopy over mine. Uh, if cold rain hits that, it causes them to explode and shower hot mercury everywhere. You don't want that. Um, the white sheet is there as basically to help amplify the light at night, um, but also as a surface for the moths to land on, so you can actually see what comes in. Um, and there's, you can also go out during the day and see lots of moths. You just have to look a lot more carefully. But, but basically, turn a light on, you'll see a lot more bang for your buck. Now, I'm often asked, how do I attract moths to my yard? How do I increase the diversity to my yard? Well, there's three things that I recommend doing. And it's nice because um, two of them involve no work. First, shrink your lawn. So here's a photo, it's right in the background. There, there's the moth sheet, the same moth sheet I showed you. I took this shot um, this morning. Um, and what we've got here, there's my existing lawn. This was lawn last year, and this was lawn two years ago. Um, and basically, if you, there's some really, a really good book uh, put up by Doug Talmy, it came out recently, um, on this topic of how s something simple as shrinking your lawn can make a huge difference. For instance, if everybody shrunk their lawn by half in the US, that would uh, increase the amount of area for nature by an area greater than all of our national parks combined in the lower 48. That's a huge amount of land we've got locked up in lawns and lawns are terrible for moths or anything really, except sod webworms. Um, some people call lawns biodiverse deserts. No, that's terrible because deserts are interesting. Deserts have a lot of life. Lawns do not shrink your lawn you'll thank me. And, and you don't have to get rid of your lawn entirely. Just if you got a part of your lawn, look at it and be like, am I using that? Just let it go. You know, it's the simplest thing you can do. And um, beyond that, so I, I zoomed in a bit to here. So this is the two year part of the lawn. So this is a lawn two years ago. And look at what has come up. Most of the, about half of this is native, actually a bit more than half, um, which I put no work in. I didn't plant a single thing here. It came up on its own. It helped itself. Now, if you want to get into gardening, plant native plants. It makes a huge difference. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I've got a beautiful Norway maple here. Well, you know what? There's one species of moth that feeds on Norway maple and a few occasionally. If you plant a sugar maple, which looks the same, you'll get at least 200 species of moths on it. So like, why plant a Norway maple? Same with like forsythia. People are like, oh, I plant forsythia. Deer don't eat it. Yeah, caterpillars don't either. Nothing eats it. Might as well put a plastic shrub out there. That's as useful as a forsythia. You know, plant native plants. You'll actually get caterpillars on it. Um, and, you know, have a diversity of plants. Remember, nature abhors a monoculture. If you plant all of one thing, you'll be susceptible to an outbreak. And the last thing, and again, this takes no effort as well, but it's really hard to hammer in people's heads. And I've had a lot of people get very stroppy with me when I suggest this. You have to be cool with caterpillars. If you want moths or butterflies, they need to eat something. And you know what? Caterpillars eat plants for the most part. And you're going to have to have to be cool with caterpillars eating plants. Now, on occasion, you'll lose an important plant. In fact, um, you know, I'm a native plant gardener. And in the past eight years of native plant gardening, I've never used herbicides. Um, I've only removed caterpillars occasionally from seedlings that I freshly planted. Um, but other than that, I leave them be. And I've only ever lost one plant to caterpillar herbivory my whole, my whole eight years of gardening in the Finger Lakes. So plants can take it. Plants are tough. And remember, they're producing these chemicals to defend themselves. Um, now you will lose some plants, but that's nature. So be cool with it. And, and it also amazes me a lot of people that have really gotten into preserving monarchs, which is great. Fantastic. Monarchs are great. But there's other caterpillars that eat monarchs or eat milkweeds too. They can share. There's plenty of milkweed to go around. And I've had so many people that contact me like, how do I get rid of these horrible caterpillars eating my milkweed? What about the monarchs? They're horrible caterpillars eating the milkweed. Like, oh, the cognitive dissonance burns my, yeah, anyways, enough of that rant. Um, so be cool with caterpillars. That's the third thing. You've got to accept that plants will get eaten. Now, once you've gotten into, into moths, 
share the data. There's lots of great tools out there. And one of the great ones I like is called iNaturalist. You get the app on your phone. You can take digital photos or whatever. Here's one where I took a photo of a moth. Uh, you'll see it in the top left there. It puts the data of where it was, the date, etc. And then what's great about this app is then it'll give you suggestions for what it might be. So the app thinks, I think it's the genus Prolimicodes. And here are the top 10 suggestions. Oh, you know what? That's exactly what it is. Now, it doesn't get it right all the time, but it's a really good useful tool um, for getting identifications on moths. So you can just take cell phone shots at your light, see what's there. And beyond that, you'll also have experts that will look at these photos and identify things for you too. Uh, if you post stuff on the Finger Lakes, I'll see it and I'll identify a lot of it as well. And I, I noticed a few people on this, uh, at this talk that are regularly contributing and identifying stuff on iNaturalist. And then iNaturalist, you can also look for an area. So here's another thing I did today is I want to see, all right, what are the moths like in the Finger Lakes? Um, so here is just what they've got in iNaturalist for moths in the Finger Lakes. So it looks like 13,000 observations, um, 1,200 species. So, hey, that's not too bad. Um, and then observers and whatnot. And there's so much data you can get here. So you try it, iNaturalist. It's amazing. Also, another reason to share the data, we need it. Um, New York has had a long history of entomology in Ithaca and the surrounding area of Ithaca and a few other scattered locations. But we know the moths well in Ithaca. Once you get outside of Ithaca, it's a black hole. For instance, in New York, a, a colleague of mine, Hugh McGinnis, and I are, are, are trying to get together a list of the moths of New York State. This has not been done in over 100 years. And the estimate that I've come up with is about 5,000 species I expect here. We've only got just under 3,000 species so far. That's embarrassing. You know, we can do way better than that. And here I've broken down the numbers by, um, by ecoregion in the state. You can see that we know it really well in the upstate part and the Finger Lakes is pretty well. Uh, but parts like the, the, uh, the Champlain Valley uh, and Western Allegheny Plateau, we know very, very poorly. And so I've been doing a lot of work in those areas. All right, so tonight we looked at a diversity of moths and basically discovered what a moth is. We looked at some of the really interesting strategies that caterpillars have for feeding and that there's a gazillion things out there trying to kill caterpillars and adults. Um, and some of the really interesting strategies that these moths have for surviving. And some interesting ways that they can hang out together and the important impact they have on our natural environment. And I hope you now have a greater appreciation for the moths of the Finger Lakes area. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna leave up this screen um, here. Um, three, three useful resources I wanna mention. There's lots of other resources, but here's three I wanted to mention. Um, my former student, Kyle Austin, made this great video series that you can get on YouTube. I didn't wanna put the lengthy address of random characters. If you Google, or if you search on YouTube for DIY entomology series, you'll come across it. Very informative on how to set up lights, traps, how to pin moths, how to dissect moths, all that. It's really interesting stuff. iNaturalist, I mentioned, join it, it's awesome. Um, and then if you wanna identify moths yourself, your best resource by far is Moth Photographers Group. You can actually select just the moths of New York State and it'll have this lovely gallery of the species that are here and lots of resources linked to it. All right, so that's enough of me yammering for now. Are there any questions? Someone is actually wondering um, about the slides about plants chemical defenses that came from another talk you gave. <laughs> And they want to know if you can give that talk soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that talk was for a tropical field entomology course. So if you take tropical field entomology, um, I'll, I'll cover that. But unfortunately, <laughs> with COVID now, we're not doing that. Um, I do occasionally give other talks um, on various topics like beneficial insects and whatnot. Um, if you go to my personal website, jasondombrowski.com, um, or just Google my name, um, I advertise what talks I'm giving. Um, and I, I use that slide in a lot of talks, actually. Um, I also talk a lot to master gardener volunteers, various naturalist groups, um, uh, and this year just in New York State because I can't get out. Okay, so let's see. Whoop. 
All right, here's one question, Jason. I expected moths would be feeding at night, but they don't seem to be doing that when they come to lights. Why do they come to lights and what are they doing there? That is a very difficult question to answer because the short answer is we don't know. Um, so why do moths come to lights? The theory I like best, which to me makes the most sense, is it actually blinds them. And so, uh, for instance, if we're out at night, you've got two different types of cells in your eye. You've got cone cells and you've got rod cells. Cone cells are for color vision during the day. At night, they shut down and your rod cells see just black and white, but are used in low light conditions. Now, it takes about 20 minutes, but about 20 minutes, you get pretty decent night vision. And you can see a lot more than you might expect if you don't use a flashlight. However, if I want to be a jerk and I take a flashlight and shine it in your eye, you've lost your night vision. And it'll take about, again, about 20 minutes to come back. Now, if you're a moth that's flying around at night, they, they often have very good night vision, and you come across a light, well, there goes your night vision. If you fly away from that light, you can't see anything now. So you're going to come back. And why would you fly off in the darkness? You can come back to the light. So I think that's what's going on. It actually blinds them. Um, but there, there are other theories out there. Um, are they actually feeding at night? So again, a lot of moths don't actually feed much. Uh, as adults. Um, some visit flowers and some definitely don't come to lights at all. Um, some are strictly diurnal as well. Um, so there's a bunch you'll never see at lights as well. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Um, does anyone know what exactly it is in owl pellets that makes them the sole diet of the moth you mentioned that feeds on them? Yeah, so that's a moth called Monopus that feeds on them. Um, now, as far as I know, I think it's Monopus dorsus strigella, which is only known from owl pellets. My suspicion is it feeds on other things. Now, with the genus Monopus, they feed on high protein things. So some of them will feed on dead rodents in your wall. Um, some will feed on dead animals, uh, but dead dry animals. So in that case, an owl pellet is full of like feathers and fur and half digested meat. And so that's the ideal food for it. So it might be a specialist on it, might feed on other dead decaying animal bits. There's actually some really interesting specializations. There's even a type of clothes moth that feeds only on rhino horns. It's called ceratophagia, which literally means horn eater. Um, so yeah, they often have really specialized diet, dietary adaptations. In Florida, you've got two types of moths that feed only inside gopher tortoise burrows on the detritus and gopher tortoise burrows. So we probably have some up here like that, but we just really don't know. There's so many moths that we have no idea. There's other ones you find feeding on detritus inside of ant nests. Um, but yeah, we don't know for most of them. All right, we have a few more questions. Should I just keep going here? Yep, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, we have a lot of people concerned in the community regarding gypsy moths. Some have considered an aerial spray company using 4A48B. What would you say about the use of that and its impact? So with gypsy moth, it's a non-native species is uh, introduced to North America. It's been here over a hundred years um, and it causes massive defoliation, especially of oak trees. And it's been a major defoliator across New York state this year. It's having a really big year. Over time, over the years, and especially in recent years, it's been, the populations have been brought under control by various agents, especially fungi that attack uh, the caterpillars. Um, so you get these occasional outbreaks that happen. Now, I mentioned with insect outbreaks, it can be a really beneficial thing. This is one where the system's not really adapted to it. Now, when you spray for a gypsy moth, though, no matter what you do, you're going to have an impact. And you've got to weigh out, will the benefit outpay the cost or outweigh the cost? Um, for certain things you can spray on, like BT, which is a, a type of bacteria which attacks the gut and ruptures it, it's fairly specific. It only attacks certain caterpillars, but it's also going to hit those other caterpillars. Um, with a lot of these other broad spectrum uh, insecticides, you're killing everything. And to me, that's, that's a no-go. I wouldn't do that at all, but that's my personal thoughts. Um, for me, on my larger trees, if I see a gypsy moth, that's where it stays. However, earlier this year, I planted a bunch of seedlings. I removed gypsy moths from those seedlings because I know the seedlings, they're fresh. They need whatever help they can get. So, for individual valuable trees, I would hand remove caterpillars, spray if you must, but again, it's going to kill everything. Um, and for larger healthy trees, yeah, it'll defoliate it, 
but it'll come back. Most of these trees will do just fine. Um, you know, it's not common that you see mortality from insect outbreaks on healthy trees. Now, if you combine it with uh, fungal pathogen or a drought or other severe conditions, then yeah, you might get tree mortality. But again, the way I see it, I love insect outbreaks, so uh, I wouldn't do anything personally, but that's my personal bias. So there's my unsatisfactory, wishy-washy answer. Do what you like. <laughs> All right, next question. For some leaf miner larvae, there are some white globules apart from black poop in the leaf blotches. Can you shed some light on that? Thanks. White globules. All right, I'm going to have to go back and look at that. I uh, just stopped sharing, but that's okay. Uh, let's see here. White globules. Oh, was it the most recent leaf miner photo? Mm, not sure. Okay. Um, if whoever posts that question, if you can, sp okay, I'll, I'll show that. Um, share screen. Um, if it's this photo, you see these white globules, those are actually the caterpillars. Um, in this species, this is one that's specific uh, to Durka palustris uh, leatherwood. Um, leatherwood's interesting because it's a very toxic plant and there's only one known herbivore on it and that's this caterpillar, this one caterpillar that feeds on it. And it does communal mining. Most leaf mines, it's one insect inside the mine, but this one it's communal. So there's a caterpillar there, 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 there. There's a whole bunch inside here. Um, in the other photo I had, uh, let's pull it up here. I didn't see blue, 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 blue. I don't see any white blotches there. Um, so I'm assuming they're talking about the last leaf miner photo. Any other questions? Yep. Um, do gypsy moth invasions actually damage forests? So again, I'll give you another wishy-washy answer here. Define damage. Um, so they certainly benefit black-billed cuckoos. They benefit a whole bunch of tachinid flies and princess wasps. They benefit fungal pathogens um, and a lot of predatory beetles that, that feed on the caterpillars. Um, are they detrimental to other things? Absolutely. They are going to cause a decrease in growth of a lot of oak species especially and in stressful years sometimes kill some of them. Um, they can negatively impact things like leaf miners because a leaf miner stuck between a leaf, well gypsy moth's going to finish that off. Um, but I can't think of any caterpillar or any moth species that's definitely disappeared due to the gypsy moth. I can think of several examples where gypsy moth spraying has wiped out certain species. Um, so again, that's what's better to have trees without leaves for, for a few weeks or no gypsy moths. And well, I'd argue the trees without leaves are much better. But again, personal bias here. Um, someone is wondering if you can suggest some public mothing spots in the tri-state area. Uh, tri-state area, so down near New York City. Um, okay, so the key things you've got to consider there are safety. Um, and basically, if you go, one of the things that people do is when you go camping to a campsite, um, visit the outhouses because outhouses often have lights at them and they're a great place to go mothing. Uh, in fact, I often get a lot of strange looks as I walk from outhouse to outhouse. Um, and I usually have to explain what I'm doing and why I'm standing by the window. Um, so make sure it's clear that people know what you're doing. Um, but yeah, you can bring your own light as well. Just make sure you check with the park staff. Um, a lot of public parks are closed after dark, so you need to seek special permission. In a non-COVID year, there's lots of public mothing events, especially during National Moth Week, um, where you can go see moths um, with, with a guide as well. Um, the tri-state area, yeah, basically find a nice natural, natural area, even your backyard. You know, I was mothing in the heart of Liverpool in the UK, not Liverpool, New York, you get a lot more moths there, but Liverpool in the UK in a place where I could probably count the number of species of plants on one hand in the yard. And I got 30 species of moths, you know, just running a light in this backyard in the middle of an urban jungle. You know, you'll get moths everywhere. Now, if you go out in the wilderness, you'll get a lot more. But uh, yeah, just find some nice land and seek permission for it. Okay, um, could the speaker talk more about the moths of New York, why they haven't been resurveyed in over 
100 years and the reference from 100 years ago? Uh, the reference for 100 years ago is Forbes's Insects of New York. Um, what was the year? It was 19, oh, I forget the year. It was in the teens, I believe. Um, but yeah, that covered all the insects known from New York at the time, including the moths. Why it's not been done since then? Because it's a lot of work, as, as we're finding out. Hugh and I are spending a lot of time on it. Now with COVID, we can't visit collections much anymore. Uh, the other challenge is identifying. Um, there's a lot of species that are tough to identify. So we're end up doing lots of dissections to uh, identify them. Um, and then just a lack of people out there looking for moths. You know, yes, Ithaca is well known. We have really good collections from Ithaca and a few other places like some of Long Island. Um, and Historically, New York City was well known, but there's not many people mossing there uh, a lot anymore. There's a few people, but not a lot. And then if you look at, like, for instance, if you want to see something telling of how poorly moths are known in New York State, um, look at iNaturalist and look at the distribution for some of the moth species. You'll see pretty much full coverage for Southern Ontario. There's, for whatever reason, a lot more naturalists that are out there mossing in Southern Ontario. Complete coverage for Vermont, like, you know, from top to bottom, Vermont is filled in because there's so many active naturalists looking at moths in Vermont. Pennsylvania is a little more spotty. Um, Ohio, there's lots of naturalists. Um, but New York, it seems we're localized in certain areas. And I know there's more naturalists in New York, just we need to share that data a lot more. So again, not a very good answer. I think it's just because we're focusing on certain areas and not others, and it's a lot of work. There's very few states that have a modern moth checklist. How about one or two more questions? All right, last question. Um, do you have tips for a fisheries and wildlife undergrad who is very interested in working with Lepidoptera after graduation? <laughs> um, well, this year sucks. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> working with Lepidoptera, I think um, it'd be worth having a conversation with me. Um, there's a lot of different avenues working on it. Uh, I tend to work on more the, the systematics end of it, the species identification, describing new species, etc. Um, some people do more work on ecology, um, some more on behavior. So it all depends on what avenue you want to go to. Um, but before that, and especially this year where school just sucks for many reasons, um, get your name out there. Make your, make your name known because once you're a known quantity, people will want to work with you and you'll have a much easier time um, getting into grad school. Um, or getting a job. So for instance, uh, again, I'll pump by naturalist here. If you go online, put your observations on there, but also go and learn groups, like go and identify other people's stuff. So if let's say like, oh, I really want to learn my underwings. Okay, let's look at the underwings, read up on it. There's lots of info online on it. Then go and identify people's underwings and people will be appreciative. And then soon you'll be known, ah, this is the guy that knows underwings and they'll tag you in it. And you'll basically build your name around that. And especially if you pick a difficult group that there's very people, people that it can identify. I specialize in leaf roller moths, which are difficult. They all pretty much look the same, uh, require a lot of dissection. And I've sort of built my name working on that group. If you work on giant silk moths, well, not so much because everybody can identify most of those. Um, so yeah, go out there, make your name known. And then, yeah, try to find, and then as far as picking a school, um, if you want to go the academic route, um, don't pick it by the school, pick it by the researcher. Look at who's doing what research. And if you like the research, contact them and contact them directly. Uh, don't uh, send a letter saying, dear sir slash madam, I find your lab interesting. I get those almost every day and I get no response. But if you respond to them and say, or, or email them and say, hey, you know, I see that you've published this paper and this paper and this paper, and I find it really interesting. And I'd love to do research like that. First of all, you stroke their ego and academics love it when you stroke their ego. There's nothing better you can do. Second, you showed that you're not just some random person sending emails to everyone, that you're actually are interested in what they're interested in. And then you'll get some serious responses. So sorry about the long winded answer there. Um, but hey, it was great pleasure chatting with everyone tonight. I hope everybody goes and turns their porch light on, or if you've got a more advanced mothing setup, and take some pictures, upload them, and discover what's out there. Thank you so much, and uh, hopefully next year we'll be doing this in person um, and actually actually add a light. <laughs> yep, hopefully. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, everybody.